Sodor is a world of wonder. There are railways and engines and tales to be told. Hello everyone, Smurfy Dan here. With a partnership of my friends Restore the Magic, which is a non-profit organization focusing on the education of railways and media, we are creating a fan-made documentary focusing on the legacy and history of Thomas and his friends, with a comprehensive look back at the development of the stories characters and the future of the franchise. As your narrator for this special, I will be taking you through the entire lifespan of Thomas from Mr. Audrey's early life to a new look of Thomas and friends with Big World, Big Adventures and beyond. In addition to Thomas, you will get an exclusive look into other shows inspired by Thomas and friends, including Tugs and Shining Time Station. From humble beginnings of the little handmade wooden toy to a global phenomenon, Thomas has inspired generations of children and adults alike for over 75 years, appearing in books and television and expanding to heritage railways and theme parks, the really useful engine is arguably the most recognisable train in the world. Although not everything about Thomas seems simple and innocent, especially with several controversies existing throughout the media. All aboard for a big adventure! Our journey begins with the life and works of the modest clergyman and family men who adored steam railways, inspiring the creation of the enchanting universe of the island of Sodor. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride for an in-depth retrospective fan documentary, Steaming to Legacy. Great Britain's long line of children's literature writers have come to be known around the world. These acclaimed authors made their names known for their iconic and lovable creations, such as Enid Blyton's Naughty, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, and A. A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh. There is one author who was not only one of the most recognised names in children's literature, but also a well-respected clergyman and a keen railway enthusiast. The creation of this series of charming books would change his life. This man is the Reverend Wilbert Audrey. In the afternoon of June 15th, 1911 in Rumsey, Hampshire, Wilbert Fear Audrey was born to his parents, Fear and Lucy Audrey. Fear Audrey was a clergyman and railway enthusiast. Much like his father, Wilbert had a sincere passion for steam trains since he was just a baby as he recalled his first experience on a train to Salisbury in February 1912. Wilbert gained a younger brother with George Audrey, born on August 10, 1916. Soon after, the Audrey family moved to Box in Wiltshire called The Wilderness, located next to the Great Western Mainline from Paddington to Bristol. Wilbert and his father, Fear, often spent time together here, spotting passing trains using a telescope. I remember we used to live and, uh, in a house within a hundred yards of the Great Western Main Line where it climbs up from Box Station up through Box Tunnel up to Corsham, a gradient for about one in a hundred. And at night as a small boy lying in bed I hear a heavy freight come into Box Station. They crow for a banker, peep, 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 and the banker would come out of his little shed and uh, buffer up behind, peep, 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 I'm ready, and off they'd go. And in my imagination, I'd hear the two engines talking to each other. The goods engine, I can't. 
banker behind. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> and so they'd go on right up until the, so the sounds of their argument were lost in the tunnel. His unique experience related be used as inspiration for what would become the story of the first two engines he bought her life many years later. Following his early years through education, his marriage with Margaret Emily Will Audrey took place in 1938. Their first child, Christopher Fear Audrey, was born in Devizes Hospital on July 2nd, 1940. And shortly after, the new Audrey family moved to their first house together at King's Norton in South Birmingham during the Second World War. My father was a curate in King's Norton in Birmingham, and my brother Christopher, who was about two at the time, was ill with measles. And uh, he had to be in a darkened room, and he wasn't allowed to use his eyes much. And uh, we'd exhausted the entertainment value of most of the nursery rhymes we knew, but there were two which still rang a bell. One was the early in the morning down at the station, all little engines standing in a row. Well, I drew some engines standing in a row. I'm not much good at drawing, so I drew them the easiest way, head on. And there was blank space. Uh, uh, the smoke boxes. So just for fun, I put little faces in. Um, it was a very simple picture. Uh, six engines lined up in an engine shed front first so they wouldn't have to bother about drawing the wheels and they all had faces and one of the faces was a sad one uh, and th this drew perhaps uh, the inevitable question why is he sad daddy well he said he hasn't been out for a long time why hasn't he been out for a long time daddy well the other engines are all bigger than he is so the drivers choose them first what's the engine's name daddy Edward he said Anyone who knows the first couple of pages of um, Edward's Day Out, the first story, um, will probably recognise those answers as being incorporated in those first two pages. And it just grew from there. Um, I obviously liked the story, so uh, Father concocted another two. Once upon a time, there was a little engine called Edward. He lived in a shed with five other engines all bigger than Edward and boasted about it. The driver won't choose you again, they said. He wants big, strong engines like us. Edward had not been out for a long time. He began to feel sad. Just then, the driver and fireman came along to start work. The driver looked at Edward. Why are you sad, he asked. Would you like to come out today? Yes, please, said Edward. So the fireman lit the fire and made a nice lot of steam. Then the driver pulled the lever and Edward puffed away. He whistled. Look at me now. The stories were liked and we had to tell them over and over and over again. And as you got to tell the story in the same, uh, same way, using the same words, I wrote them down on the backs of old circulars. In my opinion, are much the best use for circulars. So there was never any thought at this time then of publication being a possibility. No, I thought they were just for family use. So who and persuaded then, you to publish and them? And then Mrs. Audrey thought they were worth something, and in the manner of wives, she stuck uh, pins into me to do something about it. I had seen books in shops which I didn't think very much of and went home and said to Wilbert, I think yours are quite as good as this, why don't you do something about it? But he said, what? You tell me. You see, of course, I didn't know anything about publishing or printing or anything, you see. I did rather push it, I think, because I did feel they were, they were good and, of course, unusual. Well, there wasn't any time to write fair copies, so I had to send them these, uh, these dirty scraps of paper. After two years with several rejection letters due to wartime conditions and with a helpful suggestion from his wife Margaret, Wilbert submitted the stories that he had written in 1943 to a publisher named Franklin Edmund Ward. 
Mr. Ward insisted that Robert write a fourth story that would conclude the plots of Edward, Gordon and Henry. On May 12, 1945, just three and a half months before the war ended, the Free Railway Engines was published in Great Britain and became a success, selling 22,500 copies. The small book, which was perfect for small hands, contained four wonderful short stories about the adventures of three railway engines. Edward, Gordon and Henry. But what about Thomas? He will be showing up to the island shortly. The illustrations were provided by William Middleton, an inexperienced illustrator at the time who was hired for printing connections by Edmund Ward. Because of his inexperience, the illustrations looked naturally unfinished and far too simplistic in terms of scale and drawing. The biggest mistakes included two tunnels of Ballerhoo instead of one, and Henry's real arrangement, which caused huge concerns, even for Wilbert. Eventually, Middleton was fired. From the eighth impression of the book in October 1949 onward, C. Reginald Dolby reproduced the illustrations to look more recognizable, and they still are today. However, the aforementioned mistakes by Milton were also picked up in Dalby's illustrations and would continue to cause further problems down the line. In spite of the illustration miscommunications, the success of The Three Railway Engines prompted Wilbur to write a second volume to the series. This would feature Thomas and his very own book. These stories would follow Thomas's adventures from the start as a station pilot to becoming a really useful engine under the watchful eye of the fat director, of course. However, Thomas's debut came long before his first book appearance. He was based on the handcuffed wooden toy that Wilbert made for Christopher on Christmas Day 1942. After the first stories, my father made Christopher a wooden engine, Edward, and Christopher apparently wanted Gordon, but that was too difficult to model. So, tank engine, um, from bits of wood, uh, broomstick handle and things like that. Which he happened to paint blue, it happened to have six wheels, he happened to have a one on the side painted, and in time I asked for some stories about my engine. He then said, well, OK, yeah, I can make up stories about your engine, but before I can do that, your engine needs to have a name. Uh, why don't we call him Thomas the Tank Engine? Thomas? was a tank engine who lived at a big station. He had six small wheels, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy boiler, and a short stumpy dome. In September 1946, the second book of the railway series titled Thomas the Tank Engine was published. It became an instant success. These books had solidified these characters into children's literature and would launch one of the most popular children's franchises in history. Wilbert wrote a dedication to a certain young boy at the beginning of the second book. This word message read, Dear Christopher, here's your friend, Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. I hope you will like them because you helped me make them. Your loving daddy. Thomas was now the protagonist of his very own book. Taking a look at the illustrations, there were some differences between the wooden toy made by Wilbert and the very detailed tank engine that is featured in the book. Starting with the looks, the toy itself looked completely different as it was based on different engines. This could be the LNER J50 or the Hartswell clock with much smaller and curved side tanks and splashes. The illustration of Thomas is based on a London, Brighton and South Coast Railway E2 class tank engine, as illustrated by Reginald Payne, now redone by C. Reginald Dalby. The wooden toy had two simple letters on the side of Thomas's tank, N and W. This stands for North Western, although ironically, Wilbert claimed at first that this stood for Noah. The illustrator Thomas had a different inscription on him, the number one. This was also painted on the side of Thomas' cold bunker on the wooden toy, differing from the illustrated version in comparison. Why did Thomas have the number one painted on his side? 
Why was Thomas the number one engine, whereas no other engine would have assigned numbers until 1951? One of Wilbert's daughters, Veronica Chambers, answers these questions. Thomas got the number one for the simple reason that that was the easiest number to paint. After the publication of Thomas the Tank Engine, Wilbert would continue to write more stories of Thomas, James, Percy, Edward, Henry, Gordon, Toby, and all of their friends on the island of Sodor. Most of Audrey's characters were based on real-life steam locomotives. Most notably, Toby is a special engine based on a J70 steam tram. Father always used to say that he didn't have favourites because the, the engines were all his family and in a family you don't have favourites. They were his family so I don't, have the, I don't necessarily have the same restriction. No, Toby was my favourite always because a locomotive like Toby was in fact the first one that I was ever allowed to stand on way back in 1952, the August 1952. Um, and uh, as such, you know, it, uh, that was a very special thrill, obviously. And Toby is always the one that I've been most attached to. And that is how Toby the tram engine came to be. The Fat Controller brought Toby and his faithful coach Henrietta to help on Thomas's branch line after Toby's old line was closed. Another example on real life locomotives was Henry the Green Engine, whom Audrey had some issues with the character development. He was initially illustrated as a 442 Atlantic, but was changed to a 462 Pacific, similar to Gordon by William Middleton, much to Audrey's dismay. Further issues occurred with Dalby's illustrations, for Henry looked nearly identical to Gordon, which included his blue livery that was short lived, square buffers, and inconsistent portrayal as a 460 instead of a 462. Originally, Audrey wanted to get rid of Henry, but by 1951, with the publication of Henry the Green Engine, he instead had him involved in a crucial accident and rebuilt Henry into a Class 5 NT locomotive. Worse still, in early editions of the book, it contained a racial slur in the story, Henry's Sneeze. This went unnoticed until 1972, following the report from the national press. Audrey issued an apology for the offence and changed the sentence to as black as suit in later editions. Most of Wilbert's stories were based on real life events on railways. Wilbert states that whatever happened to Thomas, Gordon, Henry and the others had to have actually happened and have a railway like explanation which fitted. One example includes the story of tenders and turntables where James was spun around on the turntable. This was inspired by an actual event at Horace Junction. I mustn't stick, thought James anxiously as he ran to the turntable later. He stopped on just the right place to balance the table. It could now swing easily. His fireman turned the handle. James turned much too easily. The wind puffed him round like a top. He couldn't stop. At last the wind died down and James stopped turning, but not before Gordon, who had been turned on the loop line, had seen him. Well, well, he said, are you playing roundabouts? Poor James, feeling quite giddy, rolled off to the shed without a word. Another example is the climatic crash from A Close Shave inspired by a real-life collusion accident at the railway yard in Hull Station. Some of the stories Wilbert wrote were based on his personal experiences. While working as a guard at the Tally Claim Railway, Audrey was responsible for leaving a refreshment lady, Mrs Davies, behind. This would later be used as inspiration for the story, Peter Sam and the Refreshment Lady. The last passengers arrived. The guard was ready with his flag and whistle, the refreshment lady walked across the platform. Then it happened. The guard says that Peter Sam was too impatient. Peter Sam says he was sure he heard a whistle. Anyway, he started. Come quickly! Come quickly! He puffed. 
Stop! 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 Wail the coaches. You left her behind! You left her behind! The guard whistled and waved his red flag. The driver, looking back, saw the refreshment lady shouting and running after the train. Another example lies in the story, tit for tat. The Reverend Teddy Boston, who appeared as the fat clergyman in the story, was indeed soaked by a steam train at the Raven Glass and Eskdale Railway, as precisely descriptive in the story itself. Bert ran nicely till they reached the woods. The line climbs steeply here. Bert usually rushes the hill. This time, he deliberately dawdled. Come on, said his driver, giving him full steam. This was just what Bert wanted. Tip for tat, tip for tat, he shouted, storming up the slope. Rain-soaked branches met close overhead. Bert's blast, shooting straight up, shook them wildly. Showers of water fell on clergyman and driver. Their soaking did not stop till they had topped the rise, and steam could be reduced for the downward run. This begs the question. How did Wilbert recall his research on real-life railway incidents while coming up with new ideas for writing stories? In the days before BR lost its sense of humour and couldn't laugh at itself, in the Railway Gazette they had a delightful page which they called the Scrap Heap. And in it there were offbeat incidents which had happened. One of them was a story of how years ago an engine was coming back light from some job when suddenly the ground beneath the track started giving way. And I used that as the basis for the story Thomas Down the Mine. His driver stopped him and the fireman went to turn the points. Come on, waved the fireman, and they started. The driver leaned out of the cab to see where they were going. Now, said Thomas to himself, and bumping the trucks fiercely, he jerked his driver off the footplate. Hooray, laughed Thomas, and he followed the trucks into the siding. Stupid old board, said Thomas as he passed it. There's no danger, there's no danger. His driver... Unheard, jumped up. Look out, he shouted. The fireman clambered into the cab. Thomas squealed crossly as his brakes were applied. It's quite safe, he hissed. Come back, yelled the driver. But before they could move, there was a rumbling and the rails quivered. The fireman jumped clear. As he did so, the ballast slipped away and the rail sagged and broke. Fire and smoke, said Thomas. I'm sunk. And he was. Thomas could just see out of the hole, but he couldn't move. Oh dear, he said. I am a silly engine. But... We, could, uh, we had to have a happy ending, so Thomas had to be able to be hauled out. Is the happy ending important to your story? Oh, the happy ending is, is important. The, the engine, however much it's misbehaved, has got to express sorrow and be restored. Beginning with the three railway engines and ending with tramway engines, Wilbert wrote a total of 105 engine stories until his semi-retirement in 1972. While writing, he also served his time as a rector of Ellsworth and Knapwell in Cambridgeshire from 1946 to 1953. For the next 12 years, he became the figure of Amnath until 1965 when he retired from full-time ministry. Around this time, Very Old Engines was published to celebrate the centenary of the Tallaghlin Railway with acknowledgments from the members of the Railway Preservation Society. From this point thereafter, Wilbert moved to Stroud in Gloucestershire, where he spent his final years, but more on that later. In addition to the Railway series, which was aimed at young audiences, Wilbert penned the novellas of a spin-off called Belinda the Beetle, aimed at a much older audience. The first title was written and published in 1958, and was followed by a sequel, Belinda Beats the Band, 
a decade later. Although the engine's stories have received much recognition since 1945, Belinda sadly did not. Those interested in Audrey's engine stories are encouraged to also explore Belinda's stories as well. From Thomas' first appearance in 1946, readers will continue to follow the adventures of their favourite tank engine. Over the years, many engines will be introduced to work on the island of Sodor. There are numerous stories to be told, and this legacy has only just begun.